Amen. Please be seated this morning. All right. Good morning, Parkside. How's everybody doing? Uh, how many woke up to a little bit of a white dusting on their lawn today? Yeah, welcome to, that, that's probably the closest you'll get to a white Christmas, um, at least what I saw in the forecast. And for me, especially because we're heading out this afternoon to drive down to California, and we know it doesn't snow down there at all, okay, unless you're up in the mountains. So uh, this the extent of our wet weather, or at least uh, white, we got to experience, or I experienced it a little bit this morning. But here we are. Right, week number four of Advent. And if you haven't got the if you haven't got the memo, uh, we're talking about joy today. All the songs, everything we've read and said has directed us to this Sunday, a Sunday of joy. And this really, what I like about this Sunday, especially, is joy is going to be. We're going to carry this theme through, carry it into Christmas Eve and our Christmas Eve service. And and again, what I and after that, I just want to carry it into the new year. Right, as we close the book on 2021 enter 2022 uh, with joy in our hearts, joy for what God has done and joy for what God is going to do in this next year. So really just want this theme to just kind of carry through here uh, into the new year. Well, what I want to do, what I want to do as we kick off this morning is I want to tell you about the second greatest story ever told, right? The first greatest story we all know, right? That's the birth, death, resurrection of Jesus. But I would argue the second greatest story ever told is a Charlie Brown Christmas. Okay. Yeah, see, I get some applause there. Second greatest story ever told. So let's talk a little bit about Charlie Brown okay, and his, his bout with Christmas. If you didn't know this, the, a Charlie Brown Christmas, a TV special, it is the longest running cartoon in history. It's, it is played every year since its debut in 1965. Right, so it's been going a long time. I know I've seen it more times than I can count. Read the book, love the story. Uh, it, it's the story of Charlie Brown trying to find the meaning or the purpose behind Christmas. He finds himself, or maybe many of us do, as we enter the Christmas season. That's with just a little bit of, of trepidation and a little bit of, of wondering, okay, why? I, I, just, I just can't seem to get in the excitement of the year. I just can't seem to conjure up some happiness or some joy or some peace I'm struggling with, whatever it is you may be struggling with. And that was Charlie Brown. He was searching for happiness. He was searching for joy. Ultimately, he was searching for the meaning behind Christmas. And so Lucy, of all people, says, hey, Charlie, why do you direct the, the nativity play? Okay, let's put you in charge of that, and I think there you will find the joy in Christmas. And so he does. He puts on his director hat, and he grabs his megaphone, and he screams at the shepherds, and he screams, right, he, he's the director of this play. Well, what happens, as so often happens with Charlie Brown, is he loses control of the, the actors, right, and he can't seem to get them to do what he wants them to do, so he gets mad, and he starts screaming at them, and so finally they step in and say, okay, Charlie, we're, we're relieving you of your directorial debut, okay, and we're going to send you out, why don't you go find a Christmas tree? That's a great job for you. Go find a Christmas tree that we can put on stage that will just impact and be a great uh, addition to the nativity play. And so sure enough, Charlie Brown heads on out, goes to the tree lot. But instead of picking the tree, the big, huge, right, fully decorated, like knock your socks off tree, okay, what does he find? He chooses a little two-foot twig with like two branches on it. All right, that's his tree. In fact, we went... My family and I, we went Christmas shopping or tree shopping last Sunday afternoon, a little late, okay, but we waited till the very end, and because we waited till the very end, we were looking at some, tw some tw twigs, okay, some very small trees, but we found a tree we liked, but that was Charlie Brown. He was trying to find uh, a tree that just spoke to him, and that little tree spoke to him, so he took it back, showed it to the group, and of course, what did they do? Right, they laughed at him. He became the object of their ridicule, as Charlie Brown so often found himself in the middle of being laughed at by his gang. And so in that, he just, he loses it, right? He just, he starts really wondering, okay, what is Christmas all about? So let me just, let me just read this little portion of Charlie Brown Christmas. Charlie Brown turned to his friend, turns to Linus. He says, I guess you're right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster, I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Is there anyone 
Who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown, said Linus. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. So Linus walked to the center of the stage, a lone spotlight shone on him, and he began to speak. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So having heard Linus' explanation of what Christmas is truly about, the other kids who are listening on this too, they realize, hey, we, I think we made a mistake. We may have been a little hard on Charlie Brown. So they then go and they find his tree and they fix it all up. They decorate, they steal decorations off of Snoopy's house that he, you know, his dog house that he decorated and they put it on that tree. And so Charlie Brown returns to find the whole gang gathered around his tree in a rare moment of joy as they sing together, hark the herald angels sing as the credits roll. Charlie Brown, here's some information that somebody wants to give me. I said joy and guess what? I put it in my watch and there it is, joy. Okay, Siri heard me. Right, so he discovered in that moment the true joy of Christmas, that kind of, that kind of deep-seated, unshakable joy. Charlie Brown finally realized, I can't find that joy in a tree. I'm not going to be able to find that joy in decorations. I'm not even going to be able to find that joy in a nativity play. That joy can only be found in a relationship with Jesus. So this morning, I want to look at how you and I can experience this same type of joy. Okay, not the Hallmark happiness that is so famous right now. Right? How many of you love the Hallmark, Hallmark shows? Yeah, see, I'm not, no, I'm not down on those. Don't get me wrong, right? I mean, they're amazing. It's the same actresses and actors with the same plot. Okay, and the same ending, right? So at least you know what you're getting with a Hallmark movie. But I want to go beyond that Hallmark, you know, everything's good in the end. They lived happily ever after type of happiness. Right? I want to look at joy, right? A joy rooted in Jesus. A joy that the world cannot rip away. That the world cannot touch with whatever it is that they conjure up to try to give us joy. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and let's see if we can't discover the key to experiencing true joy. And as you turn there, let me say this about joy. Okay? Joy is not what happens to you. Joy is not what happens to you. Joy is actually what is produced in you. Right? It's not what happens to you, it's what is produced in you. Why? Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, we have a list of the fruit of the spirits. And in the, in the beginning of that, right before he lists those, there in Galatians 5, he talks about, talks about the Holy Spirit guiding your lives. He says, Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So, and then he goes on, verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, right? Not, not the anger and the, the lustful pleasures and the quarreling and the hostility, right? The selfish ambition of what we may use to try to find joy, but the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits of God, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How do we know if Jesus is at work in our lives? By the outward expression of these fruits, right? I mean, they're called fruits for a reason because fruits are meant to be shared. They're meant to be pulled off the tree and shared with others, with those around you. For Thanksgiving, we were down in California again. My, we came home with a bag full of persimmons, right? A bag full of fruit. That my dad had given to us, who actually they'd been given to him by somebody else in his church. Right? The fruit was just passed from 
one person to another and then on to the next person. That's the value of fruit. Fruit is meant to be passed on. These fruits of the Spirit are meant to be shown, expressed, and given to others. And one of those fruits, the fruit we're going to focus on this morning, is that fruit of joy. So joy comes about in the life of believers through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the first key that we're going to talk about. True joy is produced through the work and the presence in our lives of the Holy Spirit. Here in Luke 2, go to verse 25. We're going to look at a story of a, of a man named Simeon. A man named Simeon. This is after Jesus has been born. The angels have gone away, right? They've gone to Mary and Joseph. They've taken the baby Jesus to the temple to be circumcised and to be dedicated. And they're there in the temple. And this man, Simeon, shows up on the scene there in Luke 2, 25. Read this. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous, devout, and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I've seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon. Simeon expressed the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. The Holy Spirit was a part of Simeon's life. It says it in verse 25, it says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Then in verse 26, it was revealing to him. And in verse 27, it led him, right? So it was upon him, it revealed to him, and it led him. It was truly working in his life, which produced a deep-seated joy in his life upon seeing Jesus. Because of what the Holy Spirit has done, he was able to, when he came face-to-face with the Messiah, do nothing else other than praise God for what God had done. But Simeon wasn't alone. Luke tells of, of two other people that experienced joy in their life through the work of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 1, verse 11, we read about a, a man named Zechariah. We're going to read it in a second about his wife, Elizabeth. But here in verse 11, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Standing to the right of the incense altar, and Zechariah was shaken, overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Verse 14, you will have great joy. Not yet, but you will have great joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. And so after Uh, John the Baptist is born there in verse 57. We get to verse 67, and we read this. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He experienced joy as he was indwelled with, filled with the Holy Spirit in his life. Verse 39 There of chapter 1, let's read about his wife Elizabeth. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women. And your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, filled with the Holy Spirit. Caused her baby to leap for joy. Again, true joy is experienced. It's that fruit. It's produced in us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Second key. To experiencing true joy for us to understand that true joy aches true joy aches and longs for now i'm gonna le- i'm gonna let you fill in the blank there true joy aches and longs for 
Again, go back to Simeon at uh, verse 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. Simeon was longing for, he was aching for that promised Messiah. And once he came face to face with Jesus, his only response after waiting could be joy. That was all he could do. There was another person that in the temple that day. Her name was Anna, verse 36, there of Luke 2. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phineo from the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. Listen to this. She never left the temple, but she stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. Why? Because she's waiting. She's longing for. She's aching for the coming Messiah. Then verse 38. And she came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph. And she began praising God. Why? Because she became, she came face to face with what she had been waiting for. True joy comes. Just like peace, as I talked about earlier, a couple weeks ago. True joy comes in our waiting. But here's the tension. Here's the tension in this. Right? Because today we live in what theologians call the already but the not yet. Right? We're caught in this space between the already, Jesus has come, sin has been defeated, right? and the not yet of Revelation 21 and 22, right? We're, we're stuck in this awkward space because we know the end of the story. Right? Already our, already our sins have been forgiven. Jesus has come. We know that Satan will be defeated, but not yet. He has not yet been completely defeated, cast into hell for all eternity. And so we're stuck with that tension in that space in between the already Jesus has come and the not yet, the promise of Revelation 21 and 22. And so I, I feel this tension probably like you do. I feel it most when, I, when I'm praying for those who are sick. Right, or when I officiate a funeral. Or just when I watch the news. Because I know this is not what God intended. This is not the way it's supposed to be. The world is not supposed to be as it is. But unfortunately, we're still stuck in that space of the not yet. And so that causes us, or should cause us, it should drive us to like Simeon, to like Anna, to ache, to long for, to desire for Jesus to come quickly. I talked about this in week two of Advent when I talked about peace, right? Peace in the waiting. That just like peace, a longing, an aching for, O come, O come, Emmanuel, should bring about an explosion of joy when he comes. And so what, what we are looking for is we're looking for that second coming of Jesus. That's, that's you know, it, it's almost like we should rewrite the song, O come, O come, Emmanuel. To talk about his second coming because that's what we are longing for we desire for him to come back and so my question is are you longing for jesus jesus to return do you ache for that or do you fear that do you wonder that i mean I, this is uh, this is our my first christmas it's going to be my first christmas without, without my mom and as i think about that in my head right I, that's that tension that we wrestle with, because I wouldn't want her to be anywhere else but where she is, which is heaven. But I also would love to have her here. Right? That's that, that's that, that's that tension that we wrestle with. But the joy that I'm able to grasp onto, hold onto, that I long for, is when we can all be together again in heaven. And so just know this, that as we're waiting, it's not, it's not a passive waiting. I think that's where that term longing and aching comes from, because it's not meant, you know, it's not like we're supposed to kind of hunker in our house and build a, you know, a little bunker around ourselves, and okay, I'm just going to wait here until Jesus comes, let me know when he's here. It's active. I mean, look at, look at Anna, right? She, she worshiped God day and night with fasting and prayer. Her waiting was as active as it gets. 
For 60 plus years she did that. Every single day for 60 plus years she fasted and she prayed for her Messiah to return. So how are you being active in your longing? How are you being active in your waiting? Well, that takes us to the third key. Third key to experiencing true joy is to proclaim your joy. To not hide our joy, right? Again, go back to fruit. It should be shared. We should be proclaiming, hey, look at my, look at my, look at my lemon tree. Look at my orange tree, man. Come and get some of this. I got the best lemons in town. I got the best oranges you will ever taste. Your apples can't touch mine. That's the joy that we should share. We should, we should, our, our joy should be so compelling, so exciting that people are just, they come in droves because they want to know more about the joy that we have, the peace that we have, the hope that we have. You can, you can go through the list of fruits. Genuine joy leads to an outward expression of gratitude and gladness. Again, which has that ability to suck people in. Here's the question. What's attractive to a world searching for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness? What's attractive to a world searching for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness? I'll tell you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. That's what's attractive to them because that's what they're longing for. And we have it. If we are allowing the Holy Spirit to produce that in us, then we have it. We just need to proclaim it and share it and invite people into our spiritual orchard so they can pick the, that fruit off of the tree. So they can share in the joy that we have, in the love that we have, in the peace that we have, in all those fruits of the Spirit. We called this series Rediscovering Christmas because I want us to rediscover our orchard of fruit that we have as the Holy Spirit works in our lives that is produced in us the hope that is found in our relationship with God. The peace that comes from knowing that our sins have been forever forgiven and that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us teaching us about God's love, a love made visible through the birth of Jesus that brought joy to a man named Simeon, a, a, to a woman named Anna, and to a world searching for a Savior. Right? That's the point of Christmas. And so that begs the question, how are you proclaiming joy? this Christmas? How are you proclaiming peace this Christmas? How are you proclaiming love and hope, gentleness, kindness, self-control, so that others can know more about the good news that will, be, that will bring great joy to all people? Let me close with a story that for me, just kind of brought this whole idea of joy into, into uh, you know, uh, where I could easily see it, okay, grasp it. When I started ministry, I started out like a lot of pastors do, right? You, you cut your teeth in youth ministry. And so I remember for the first five years, the church I was at doing youth ministry, we would travel every spring break. I would pile up three, four, five vans full of teenagers and adults, and we'd travel to Mexico, just outside Mexicali, where we would put on a VBS program for a week, week-long VBS program to hundreds of, of kids. In fact, our church, we owned, a, we owned a, well, we called it a compound. We owned a, a, a building there in just outside Mexicali. In fact, it's probably the shape of the L-wing would be the best way to describe it because it was in the shape of L. It had probably eight-ish rooms. Okay? And then in the middle of that was a big patio, big concrete patio with a basketball hoop and that's where we would do VBS and we had benches we'd bring out and you know the kids would come in the morning we'd put that on in the afternoon we'd go out there was a soccer field a big empty dirt lot we call it a soccer field a dirt lot just outside of the gates we'd go out there play for hours with the kids up in the you know play soccer and kick balls around and play with them and then we'd spend the rest of the day into the evening going around the neighborhood and talking with families inviting kids Inviting families to the next day's 
VBS program. And so we do this for a week, and it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't the best of accommodations. And it wasn't easy to get there. I mean, it involved getting just there involved a 13 to 14 hour van ride. So just think about that for a second. You know, you're cramming 15 kids into a 15 passenger van, okay? And, you know, driving 13, 14 hours, leaving at 6 in the morning, getting there 7, 8 o'clock at night, having to unload everything, okay? Getting everything put in where it needed to go. And then what do you get to sleep on? I get to sleep on a concrete floor. Crammed in with 25 of my best friends. I'm telling you, by like, week, by like day four, it smelled like a locker room. Especially the guys one. Okay, you're sleeping on a concrete floor. Now luckily, it, it, it didn't necessarily get cold because it was like 95 degrees outside. In fact, you had the opposite. It was stuffy and hot. Okay, our, our, our plumbing wasn't the best in the world. The only way to flush the toilet, okay, not to get too crude here, was with a five-gallon bucket of water. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Bucket of water, boom, flushed. And that was it. That was, that was your only option on that one. In fact, one year, it went out, it got clogged. You had to, we had to dig a whole big ditch and repair. I mean, I, the accommodations, like I said, were not, you know, Best Western, Motel 6. I mean, it was, it was harsh. It was also hot. Right, like I said, 99, 5 degrees. So you'd spend the afternoon with these kids for hours. They'd want to play with you and tug at you and chase you around and throw things at you in the 90, 95 degree heat. But with all of that in mind, right, no sleep, no shower. We didn't take any showers, by the way, for the week, right? So no sleep, no showers, hot, right, lack of, I mean, just all of that. I remember driving home, driving by Disneyland. And I point out, hey, guys. Guess what we're not going? Because okay. we got excited. Guess what we're not going? We're not going to the happiest place on earth. And one of my kids, one of my high school students, looked at me and said, you're wrong. We just left the happiest place on earth. Because their joy was found in sharing Jesus with kids. Their joy was found in a 13-hour van ride. Their joy was found in sleeping on a concrete floor. Their joy was found in having to flush a toilet with a five-gallon bucket of water. Their joy was found in playing for hours with kids on a, in a dirt lot in 95-degree heat. Their joy was in not taking a shower for six days. Well, how is that? Well, because their joy was not based on their circumstances. It was not a hallmark joy. Their joy was not found in what happened to them. Their joy was what was produced in them. And in them was a joy that was unshakable, a joy that was rooted in Jesus and a joy that they wanted to share with anybody and everybody that we could find on the streets of Mexicali. So where do you find your joy? How do you tap in? that joy that only comes from the Holy Spirit and what are you doing to compel others to be a part of that joy that you have that joy that comes as we long for Jesus come quickly Lord Jesus come quickly we're going to carry this over like I said at the beginning to Christmas Eve Right, where our joy will continue as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And then on the 26th, right, on, online only, but again, joy for the birth of Jesus. And then the following Sunday, January 2nd, we talked about a new series. And it's again, it's all the same. It's a joy that's found in a redeeming God. It's a joy that's found in the gospel. It's a joy that's rooted in Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for a joy that is not is not based on what happens to us. Our joy is not determined by our daily circumstances, but our joy is found in you. God, our joy is found in the 
Holy Spirit working in our lives. God, I pray that you would help each of us, God, to daily focus on the fruits of the Spirit so that we can continue to grow in each of those areas. Peace, love, joy, gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, self-control. And that we would then want to harvest those and give those away to others so that they too can experience you. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together to pray, to sing, and to hear your word, God. And now I pray that we would take that out with us, that we would be a light to our community, that we would be an expression of your love in us and through us. God, we love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.